kind words and thank you all for joining us um, again on, on this particular occasion. Um, I'm really glad of this opportunity to be able to, to speak about this area. And I, I say this is an area of the law that until recently received far less attention than other rules um, of IHL, in particular the rules regulating conduct of facilities, but also deprivation of liberty. And this is really unwarranted because in most modern conflicts, more civilian, there are more civilian deaths and suffering as a result of humanitarian crises, either caused or exacerbated by conflicts, than from the actual hostilities. However, until recently, this area of law really received very little attention. As Maria said, I used to work for ICRC and for 10 years, not for 10 years, sorry, for seven years, I was responsible for the access file as a legal advisor. In seven years, I did not have a single question. And that's why, because it was not considered so much of a legal topic, there were obvious constant challenges to humanitarian access, but they were addressed as an operational concern. And it was only with the conflict in Syria um, that we were prompted to look uh, more closely at the key aspects of the rules regulating humanitarian relief operations. And it was in fact the conflict in Syria that led to the elaboration of the Oxford guidance that, that you have. So what I propose to do today is to present key elements of the law regulating relief operations, zooming in on the points that have proved particularly challenging in recent conflicts. So as Maria said, um, I'm keen to answer your questions. I think that in addition to a question and answer session at the end, there are two clear moments where I'm happy to, to interrupt, to stop a moment, to pause and say, is everything clear up to now? So the first Point we need to start off with is clarity on what constitute humanitarian relief operations for the purpose of IHL. And these are include, but are not limited to, operations to provide food, water, medical supplies, clothing, bedding, means of shelter, heating fuels, and, and other supplies and related services essential for the survival of the civilians population. So that's the focus. It's really what's essential for the survival. We're setting a pretty low threshold. It's not operations more broadly. And for the rules of IHL to apply, the operations need to be exclusively humanitarian in character. So their purpose must be solely to assist people in need, and they must be impartial and this has a particular meaning in international humanitarian law humanitarian principles impartial humanitarian action means that they need to be carried out without adverse distinction so no discrimination and importantly that priority be given to those in greatest need this is what the term impartiality means possibly different to what you'd understand it in other areas of law where impartial actually means neutral and not taking Science. Now, a variety of actors in theory can carry out relief operations. States can do so, international organizations, and also private actors like NGOs. Again, in order to benefit from the rules that I'm going to outline, the activities need to be exclusively humanitarian and carried out impartially. What do we see? In practice, it is principally intergovernmental organizations, such as the UN and its very specialized agencies, um, the components of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movements, and NGOs that actually conduct relief operations. States, the EU, tend to fund them. Again, it's important to understand the allocation of response, or who, who actually carries things out. Now, luckily for us, Let's move now to the rules. The rules regulating humanitarian assistance are simple. The essence is pretty simple, and they are essentially the same in international and non-international armed conflict. I think they differ in one key aspect, and I'll look at that in a moment. So four elements to bear in mind. First, primary responsibility for meeting the needs of civilians lies with the party to the conflict in whose control they find themselves. It can either be the state, 
or unorganized armed groups. This sounds pretty straightforward, but it's something that I frequently have to remind my humanitarian colleagues. And I say, hold on, step one is to responsabilize the party um, that is in control of the population. Second step is if this party is unable or unwilling to meet the basic needs, and again, we're talking very basic needs of civilians, um, and other people entitled to assistance, and I'm not going to go into it, it's people deprived of their liberty, the wounded and sick are of course also entitled to assistance. I'm going to focus on civilian populations more generally. So if this party with primary responsibility is unable or unwilling to meet the basic needs, states and humanitarian organizations may offer and make offers to carry out relief actions, again, that are impartial, and conducted with adverse distinction. In the majority of situations, and I'll come to this in a moment, the consent of the affected states is required. So you offer to carry out services, but you need the consent of the state to actually operate. Consent is required, but may not be arbitrarily withheld. And I'll pack these element, unpack them in a moment. So that's step one. You, a conflict has broken out and needs are unmet. An organization can't just rock up. They've got to ask for authorization to operate, step one. Step two, once this consent has been obtained, once relief actions have been authorized, then significantly all parties to the armed conflict and also relevant neighboring states must allow and facilitate the rapid and unimpeded passage of relief consignments, equipment and personnel, but may prescribe technical arrangements, measures of control regulating such passage. So the important things to bear in mind and I, is that there are two stages. There is the initial authorization, the initial consent to come and operate, and it is in relation to this that we look at is it arbitrarily withheld? And then the second stage, once you're, yes, come, you can come and work here, then the obligation is different. It's allow and facilitate. And what I always tell people is, hold on a moment, in applying the law, you need to stop and think and say, at what stage am I? Am I at the initial stage where I want to go and operate in country X? Or am I at the second stage? I've been allowed to operate, I'm there, and it's a question of the obligation to allow and facilitate. So if you remember one thing from this presentation, it's stop and think at which stage you are. Now, in um, let's look at the question of initial authorization. And this is something that um, caught a lot of attention in relation to Syria. Why? Because we were in a situation that was essentially a development context. War broke out and there were a lot of actors who were trying to come in and operate. And that's why the whole question of consent became very relevant. But let's take a step back. As I said, consent is required not to arbit be arbitrarily withheld. The first question is, hold on a moment, whose consent? Now, in situations of armed conflict, the law is pretty quick. We're looking at Article 70 of Additional Protocol 1, and it says that um, um, relief op op uh, operations shall be undertaken subject to the agreement of the parties concerned. So it's clear we need the agreement. Who are the parties concerned? Well, very clearly the state in whose territory you want to conduct the operations. The consent of the enemy state is not required unless you need to transit through territory under its control. Very straightforward as a matter of law and very intuitive operationally. The situation is more complex in non-international armed conflict, as always. And in particular, the question arises, and this is what we saw in Syria, if we have a situation where there is one part of the territory that is not under government control, it's under the control of organized armed groups, and relief actions can be conducted there from neighboring states directly without transiting through territory under the control of the state. In those circumstances, 
is the consent of the state required as a matter of law? And this is exactly what we were looking at in Syria. And the law, there's divergence of views as to what the law actually says. And it's two provisions that we're looking at. Um, common Article 3.2 of the Geneva Conventions provides that an impartial body may offer its services to parties to the conflict. Full stop. So yes, it's possible to go to the state, go to the organized armed group, but the provision doesn't say um, whose consent is required. It just doesn't address the question of, okay, is it enough that I get the consent of the organized armed group, or do I also get need the consent of the state? Some, um, like MSF, for example, have said, fine, this implicitly means that if I don't have to transit through the territory of the state, Article 3.2 implicitly states that it is enough for me to get the consent of the organized armed groups. Um, taking a more traditional public international law perspective, others have said, look, going into the territory of a state without its consent actually violates its sovereignty and territorial integrity. It could be that the law foresees this, but we feel uncomfortable accepting this from the silence, from a provision that doesn't address this at all. So divergence of views as to common article three, the effect of common article three. At best, common article three, even if it could apply in this way, would only cover activities um, by impartial um, humanitarian bodies. So NGOs, maybe the UN, and I can tell you how the UN's interpreted Syria later, but definitely not actors that are not impartial humanitarian bodies like state. The second relevant provision is Article 18.2 of Additional Protocol 2. And you'd think it's clearer on this because it expressly requires um, the consent of the high contracting party concerned. Now, to me, that would indicate it's very clear that you need the consent of the state. That's who the high contracting party is. And this is what some of the interpretations at the time of the negotiations and also subsequently by some states have indicated. However, again, divergence of view in relation to Syria. And there were some people who said, no, 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 a high contracting party is only concerned by relief operations if it's in control of the territory. If it's not, it's not concerned. And therefore, its consent is not required. Again, I took a, as you'll see, the Oxford guidance took a, a more conservative approach, if you want, and said, look, it's very difficult to consider a state not concerned by activities that are taking place in its territory, um, all the more so in territory not under its control. And also this interpretation, um, if you look at Article 18.2, it refers to the consent of the high contracting party concerned, and it, it would be odd to to somehow say, well, this isn't relevant. This express re um, reference isn't relevant. So I have to say divergence of views on this, on whether as a matter of law, the consent of the state is required for activities that are conducted in areas under its control that don't need to transit, sorry, areas not under its control that can be reached directly. Divergence of views. It was very live in relation to Syria because factually it was something that, that was arising there. And what happened? The UN took a very conservative or predictable uh, approach and said, as far as the UN is concerned, the consent of Damascus is required. So no UN operations, no operations funded by the UN could go in without the consent of Damascus. Understandable. Um, we can discuss Syria later. In a way, we came out of this impasse because for the first time ever, the Security Council actually imposed operations on a country, essentially sidestepping the rules of IHL. So this is about... I think it's important to bear in mind that for the most part, these problems don't arise. It's not at this initial moment that problems arise. It's at the second stage that they come up, um, that they arise. But it's important to know what the law says. Now, backpedaling, whose consent is required? Uh, sorry, another important point to bear in mind is I'm talking about whose consent is required 
as a matter of law. Now, operationally, it is clear that in order to operate, to even transit through territory safely, it's important to obtain the authorization, the green lights of all the parties that have presence or that have authority over a particular territory. That's as a matter of practice. And if you were to speak to a humanitarian agency, it would say, yes, of course, we obtain safety guarantees from all the parties that are present, state and non-state. But that's operationally. Now, um, as I said, while the consent, and let's take a conservative approach, or the legally correct approach, um, and say the consent of the state is always required, there are two situations um, where states, yes, we need their consent, but they have no latitude not to give the consent. That's the first is in situations of occupation. That's something that's expressly addressed by the Fourth Geneva Convention, which states, which requires the responsibility for meeting needs is on the occupying power because it has control. And the law states very clearly that if there are unmet needs, it must accept offers to carry out relief operations. It needs to accept them. Obviously, it's not that everyone can come in. It can regulate who comes in as long as the needs are met. So that's the first situation where there is no latitude to withhold consent. And the second is the rather exceptional one where the Security Council has imposed relief operations, which is what we see we saw in Syria and we've discussed now. So in all other situations, the consent is, of the state is required in the sense of you need to, to get authorization. However, consent may not be arbitrarily withheld. And that's the other, the, the second um, legal question that we were floundering a bit when it came to, to Syria because, OK, what does it actually mean? And this isn't, although central to the rules regulating relief operations, this wasn't something that was addressed in any treaty. In fact, if you actually look at the relevant provisions, they don't mention arbitrary withholding of consent. But it's very clear from all the travaux that this is what was understood. That's how you reconcile the relief operations shall be conducted subject to the agreement. That's how they reconciled it. But nowhere had this notion been unpacked. It hadn't been addressed by any court, any manual, any treaty body. So this is what the Oxford guidance was initially instructed to do. Tell us, tell us what it means. So what we had to do um, with um, a number of experts was, OK, what does it actually mean to arbitrary withhold consent. And so we had a look at the notion of arbitrariness under a number of different bodies of international law to try and distill some elements of it. And what we did was identify three circumstances, three sets of circumstances in which consent would be held arbitrarily. The first is um, if consent is withheld, in circumstances that would result in a violation by a state of its obligations with respect to the civilian population. So let me give you some examples of this. Consent would be held arbitrarily in, in situations where doing so would lead to a violation of IHL. For example, withholding um, consent in uh, situations where the purpose of doing this is to cause contribute or perpetuate starvation of the civilian population, because this would violate the prohibition of starvation of the civilian population as a method of warfare. Another example would be withholding consent to medical relief operations. For example, and again, something that we saw in Syria, because medical supplies could treat wounded enemy combatants. Now that's clearly in violation of the foundational rule of IHL that the wounded and sick, civilians and fighters alike, are entitled to medical care. So what we were seeing in Syria was a systematic withholding of, of consent. This is really what we're talking about to medical operations for this reason. Clearly, um, clearly arbitrary. Another example would be, for example, selective withholding of consent with the intent of discriminating against a particular group or a section of the civilian population. For example, systematically rejecting offers to conduct operations in areas 
populated by groups perceived as favoring the enemy. This would be contrary to the prohibition on discrimination. So this is the first type of heading. The second heading would be withholding consent in violation of the principles of necessity and proportionality as understood under human rights law, not IHL proportionality, but human rights law proportionality. What does that mean? And we're looking at human rights law for a measure not to be arbitrary. It must be necessary, no more than necessary, and proportionate to the end sought. So let's apply this to relief operations. Where consent is withheld for a valid reason, it'll nonetheless be arbitrary if it exceeds what's necessary in the circumstances. So limitations in terms of time, duration, locations, and types of affected goods must not go beyond what's absolutely necessary to achieve the legitimate aim. And then the third heading of arbitrary is withholding consent in a manner that's unreasonable or that might lead to injustice or lack of credibility. And this is focuses on the manner. So not so much the reasons and the substance, but the manner um, in which consent is withheld, whether it's unreasonable or, un, um, or could lead to injustice. So a possible example would be a total failure to engage at all. Like people, our organization is asked, can we come, can we come, can we come? Total silence. That would be arbitrary because there's no way of assessing whether the reasons for withholding consent are or are not legitimate. So that's what the, um, the Oxford guidance did, was try to provide these three elements of arbitrariness to, to, to try and guide us a bit. And it was interesting, I mean, as part of the exercise of elaborating the guidance, it was really interesting because until then, the focus had not been on determining what is arbitrary withholding of consent, but the converse saying, in these circumstances, you can withhold consent. And as we were elaborating, that and we were taking that route, Walter Kalin, who some of you might know, said, well, and Bashir is really going to thank you for that, Manu, because you're giving him the list of examples that he can rely. And it was one of those moments that you go, oh man, absolutely right, thank you so much. And we flipped it and said, okay, this is what would make it arbitrary. And I think this is also interesting in terms of the process of elaborating instruments, be strategic. So I'm going to stop here for a moment because in a way this is a natural moment for questions again on the first stage of the rules. Any questions? Please if you have any questions you can take the floor here just uh, you can raise your question briefly or uh, maybe otherwise we can proceed and take it as a whole I don't know Manu whatever you um, yes, no, I'm happy to, I mean, if there's no, if there's no question, you know how good I am with technology, but there don't <laughs> appear to be any questions. So I'm going to, to proceed again. Let's remember where we are. So far, we've discussed situations where an organization wants to come into the country to operate. Now we've got to the stage where they've got the green light, they've got their memorandum of understanding with the relevant part of the, con of the government and want to act actually start implementing their operations. Now, what does the law say? Here, um, we have a very clear statement that once um, consent has been obtained, all parties to an armed conflict. So although as a matter of law, it was only the consent of the state that was required, it's all parties to an armed conflict must allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of relief supplies, equipment and personnel throughout the territory under their control. And this obligation covers both initial entry into the country, so looking at visas, customs and so on and so forth, but also movement within it. So there's this clear obligation to allow and facilitate, but an entitlement to prescribe technical arrangements for some passage, for this passage. So this is usually when problems arise. The, the greatest number of problems arise at this stage. And something that's important, I mean, I think there's two elements to, to bring out. The first is that the law says there's this obligation. 
information, but doesn't actually elaborate very much in terms of what it actually entails. I'll tell you this, I'll show you this in a moment. So the law doesn't give us very much. And also what's important to bear in mind is that not every impediment to humanitarian action is a violation of this obligation. It, it just isn't. That's not how the law works. It's not that, hey, you're stuck at a checkpoint for two hours, <gasps> violated. It, it's not that clear cut. There is this general obligation um, to allow and facilitate, but it allows considerable discretion. So apart from circumstances where specific conduct is required, this obligation to allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage can be discharged in a number of ways. And so parties really have considerable discretion in its implementation. So IHL only um, prescribes a small number of specific measures that, that must be taken. So parties must not divert relief supplies from their intended purpose or delay their forwarding in case, uh, apart from the case of urgent necessities. Second, restrictions may be imposed on activities and importantly on freedom of movement of relief personnel only in the event of imperative military necessity, such as in the case of military operations. And even then, the restrictions may only be temporary. And then in situations of occupations, all the relief consignments must be exempt from charges, taxes or customs. But this is all. We have. As you can see, it, it's really not very much at all. Now, when I was working with, with OCHA, we were elaborating all kinds of good practice based on measures taken in natural disasters that could be helpful to allow and facilitate simplifying and expediting entry visa procedures, waiving or reducing customs inspections, granting permits for the free passage of relief operations, all the way down from capital, importantly, all the way down to field level. It's no good if it's just capital that knows this. It's got to be the person at the checkpoint. Um, reducing administrative procedures and other formalities as possible. You can see there's lots of things that can be done, but they're not required as a matter of law. And that's a bit the challenge of this particular area of law, that there's really so much technical, so much um, discretion that's left. What's also important to bear in mind is that there is a quid pro quo as always and this is understandable. Yes parties are required to allow and facilitate the passage but they are entitled to impose measures of control or technical arrangements for such passage. What They can serve a variety of purpose. For example they allow parties to the conflict to assure themselves that the, the relief consignments are exclusively humanitarian, that there's no, med, there's no military equipment in them. They can prevent uh, relief uh, convoys from being endangered by ongoing um, hostilities or from hampering the hostilities. Um, they can ensure that um, the, the, the supplies meet minimum health and safety standards. We don't think about this much, but it is a live issue. Some examples can be searches of consignments to check that they don't contain weapons or military equipment, um, requiring convoys to use particular routes at particular times to ensure that they don't hamper and are not endangered by military operations. Um, another issue that arises frequently are concerns about diversion of the relief of, of, of the goods. So they relief. Um, so parties can actually say, no, you need to have measures to ensure that the distribution, that the goods are only provided to the intended beneficiaries. So again, a number of possibilities for them to specify how relief operations are to be conducted. And again, it's, it's understandable, particularly in situations of active fighting, it is understandable that the parties don't want this, don't want relief operations to be abused, don't want them to be endangered, don't want them to hamper military operations. So again, an understandable desire of IHL as always to balance humanitarian response, i.e. humanitarian side of things with the military realities of where they're taking place. Now, my final point for now, perhaps, is a question that arose a lot 
again in, in relation to Syria. Um, and is relevant, I forgot that this was the, the war crimes um, course, sorry, so I wasn't going to talk about war crimes, but I'm, I'm going to start the conversation there. I think what's very difficult as a matter of law, but also practice, is determining when the rules of IHL on, on relief operations have been violated. You know, clearly, if you've got prohibition on, on torture, very clear, any moment someone's torture, it's a violation. Prohibition on sexual violence, very clear. Then there are rules such as those on conduct of facilities where it's much harder to, particularly from the outside, determine where there's been a violation. And I'd say the rules on humanitarian relief operations are particularly difficult. Why? I think we've got a bit, I think we can say they're violated when consent is withheld arbitrarily. In a way, that's, that's easy. We've got a framework of analysis. It's much harder, as I said, to determine at what point um, the rules, the obligation to allow and facilitate has been violated, um, just because there is so much discretion. And my suggestion is the way I look at it is that you mustn't look Look at it in terms of the bilateral relationship between one particular humanitarian organization and say, I'm making it up. The obligate MSF has been unable to operate. You said you can come, but essentially you haven't allowed and facilitated its operations. Therefore, violation of the rules regulating humanitarian relief operations. No, you mustn't look at it in terms of the bilateral relationship with a particular organization. Instead, the starting point is once again the position of the civilian populations or the particular populations that we're looking at and say, have they been deprived of the objects indispensable to their survival as a whole? So to continue with the example of MSF, if the populations in need have managed to get medical assistance from other sources, from other NGOs, then you can't say that the obligation to allow and facilitate has been violated just because MSF can't operate. So again, you've got to look at it. The starting point was, are the needs of the civilian population being met, yes or no? That was the starting point of our analysis. And it's also the starting point of, for making the determination of violation. Are there segments of the population that are being deprived of particular goods necessary for their survival? If so, that's when we could say violation of the rules to allow and facilitate. That's the framework of analysis. I, I feel like stopping here. There's a, a further segment, if we want, which kind of goes to, to war crimes. I'm just, I could flag it. And also, fine, what happens operationally if there is this, if the, 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 um, the obligation to allow and facilitate or if the rules have been violated. But let's stop here again. Thank you very much, Manu. That was uh, wonderful in the sense that it was uh, it was very very clear. You man you addressed an extremely uh, complicating uh, topic in a very clear but also very nuanced way because you highlighted uh, discretion, grey areas, controversies, and things that we cannot simply explain uh, to 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 laymen. And I would say that uh, I found very, very interesting two things you highlighted. In particular, one was about how strategic your mindset was, you know, when DAPO said, OK, great, which says a lot how you, um, you framed the issues of legal imagination, how you frame normative um, tools. Uh, which is a big lesson, uh, but also very much the, the the nature of IHL, you know, which is always balancing humanitarian consideration with with military with a military conflict with military necessity, and it's something which is very very difficult and sometimes becomes very annoying to people to 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 fully grasp. So I stop here. I would like to start giving the floor uh, to people who have raised uh, topics, and I encourage you to to even raise your hand. I can I can I can uh, read. Um, uh, I can see the first okay. here. Uh, I saw there was something else. Maybe Liz, I can I can see the first. Okay. Your experience, how significant are the the delays in aid delivery caused by feed dragging on the side of the party that should provide consent? Can you, Thank can you. you Thank you so much. I can. I can. I can't read the name properly, though. So I'm sorry. I'm not going to. Thank you for that question. And again, um, let's break it 
apart because you've asking me how significant are delays in aid delivery um, on the side that should provide consent. I'd say that in terms of providing initial consent, Syria has really made us look at it. For the most part, states uh, either we are in situations of ongoing conflict and humanitarian actors have been there forever, um, that you don't need the initial consent, or it's not at this point that we have problems. I think the problems in, in feet dragging, as you say, tend to be caused at the second stage. So, every, so it's not a question of consent, but it's the parties that should be allowing and facilitating. And usually the state that should be doing this. That's really when, as you say, most of the delays occur. I would say most of the challenges occur. And it's usually, it's not usually intentional, but quite frequently you can start seeing when it's quite intentional. There's a really good, it's a bit old now, there's a piece called, I think, Death by a Thousand Paper Cuts in relation to, to South Sudan, I think. And it was really showing how administrative impediments, that's what they're called, administrative impediments, so delays in granting visas, delays in letting stuff in, delays in authorizing movements, and ideally they shouldn't be authorizing movements, but that was also part of the process. All of these delays were in fact, and the request for additional paperwork, it was these kinds of impediments that were the ones that were really slowing the capacity to respond. Search arrangements. And I'd say very, as I keep on saying, as lawyers, we get fascinated with consent just because it's legal. But operationally, it's at this stage um, that all the problems tend to arise. And it's a it's a war of attrition there to try and, and get everything through. Is there, shall I keep going? Yes, yes, oh please. Goodness. Excellent question. Oh, dear. So, so <laughs> is there a distinction between cross-border and cross-line in terms of legal consent of the parties? Thank you for the question, because in a way, everyone has become rather obsessed with these two terms, cross-border and cross-line. And um, while, in fact, the question is consent, it, the modality doesn't really matter because assistance always needs to come in cross-border somehow <laughs> like it, it does, it's not there um but the problem is who is on the other side of the border is it the state or like in situations like syria is it an organized armed group and then that's when we have the question of is the consent of the state required um for operations in such area so i would say don't don't focus on the modalities cross border or cross line. Instead, look at look at it in terms of who has control over that particular area of land, and then say, fine. Is it enough to get its consent, or do I also need the consent of the other party? And as I said, there's two analysis. I mean, this arises most. As a matter of law, essentially the question is, is the consent of the state required even in situations where I can operate in areas under the control of the organized armed group? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Now, I think just because we're having a good chat, in Syria, it was um, it was interesting because at some point, we, the whole legal analysis was, is Damascus's consent required for operations in opposition held areas? So. Geographically, they were cross-border. But then what we also saw, particularly now in the conflict, as there should be more cross-line operations, so operations coming from areas under Damascus's control to those under the opposition control, what we are now seeing is that the opposition, the, the opposition, the organized armed groups, is saying, no, we're not going to let um, assistance come in cross-line. Now, as I said, as a matter of law, their consent isn't required. Funnily enough, but operationally, <laughs> they're in control. So if they don't let it in, it's not coming in. So it's one of those areas where, yes, it's important to know the law, but knowing the law isn't enough because you've got the practical realities on the ground. <laughs>
can I speak about the current situation in Sudan? Well, funnily enough, funnily enough, um, that came up in my emails just yesterday. <laughs> and I'm scrolling up because we had Sudan is a very similar situation um, to Syria, I understand factually, in the sense of that until recently, apologies, I'm scrolling through my emails to try and get it correct. Uh, uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, until recently, Sudan, and correct me if I'm getting it wrong, um, was allowing assistance to come in from Chad. It was saying, yep, yeah, it, it can come in from Chad until very recently. And then what it has said now is no. It can no longer come in from Chad because the areas of the border neighboring Chad are not under its control. And it's saying that the assistance that's coming in is, and I'm sorry, I haven't got the details here. Ah, they're saying something along the lines that the assistance that's coming in includes military assistance. So I am not allowing assistance to come in through there. Instead, it needs to come in through Port Sudan. So rather similar to the situation we saw in relation to Syria, with the government now saying, no, it's only got to come through area under my control, and then I will allow it to move on. Um, so interesting, with no Security Council involvement yet. You have three questions. Uh, the first one is about sanctions. To what extent uh -huh. sanctions have any bearing on humanitarian aid? Um, there is a question about Gaza. Uh, yes. Are you able to provide an overview? Uh, I was going to ask as well, but Katie uh, yes. asked that of how this applies in Gaza presently with regards to difficulties in regulated humanitarian relief. I want to ask you also about how, to what extent the provisional order uh, of the ICJ, uh, uh, if, it, if there is something else, you know, if, if, if there is something additional, and uh, oh my God, you have many, many questions. Right. <laughs> of course. Uh, do you want to start with this yeah. too? And, and then Let me see. yes, absolutely. Now I'm happy to have a different session on sanctions because I think it's something very topical across context. And why can they cause, yes, they can cause tension with humanitarian assistance in a nutshell. Why? Um, it's principally restrictions in financial sanctions. They prefer prohibit making funds or assets available directly or indirectly to persons or groups that are designated under sanctions. At times, these are, for example, in non-international armed conflicts, these are groups that are parties to non-international armed conflict, and there is a concern that assets that might end up in their hands, payments that need to be made for them. Hamas, Hamas was designated under the um, EU CT sanctions, Hamas was running Gaza, you had to pay taxes, licenses to Hamas. Clearly inconsistent with the prohibition in sanctions. We have seen that progressively there's been a willingness of states to adopt exceptions for humanitarian action. So in a pill, that's where it is. Happy to have a session specifically on sanctions, Maria. How, um, an answer on Gaza perhaps, does that, shall I go for Gaza now, Maria? Yes. And so I, with regard to Gaza, first, primary responsibility for meeting the needs lies with the occupying power. So that's where primary responsibility lies. Second, um, in such circumstances, the, if there are unmet needs, the occupying power has no latitude to withhold consent. Now, whatever we might think of the status of Gaza pre October the 10th, pre whatever, um, humanitarian action was always being allowed within Gaza. There was no there was no question of consent being withheld. There's an, uh, so in a way we can park that part of the law. That wasn't the issue. The issue is whether the rules regulating um, the part of the rules that require path is to allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage are being violated. And as I said, here we've got to, to look at the realities. Yes, there is this obligation to allow and facilitate, but also there is this entitlement to impose technical arrangements for such passage. And 
as always, we need to look at the context. So what was an acceptable technical arrangement pre uh, end of October, so whenever the fighting started in Gaza, what was an acceptable arrangement in terms of searches? And obviously there is an entitlement to carry out searches. What was an acceptable arrangement in terms of regulating passage? And for the most part, there weren't problems to the extent that they were delays. It was about um, searches and the types of items that were going in. But we were clearly moving well beyond the types of assistance that was necessary for humanitarian action. We were looking at development activities. If before it was um, the searches of the items coming in, we're in a very different operational reality now where searches are still necessary. From what I understand, Maria and I were kind of scrolling through recent emails to try and see what the impediments are, the types of impediments are today. I think for the most part, the sticking point isn't the searches to bring items in anymore. The sticking point is the very clear reality that there is ongoing fighting within Gaza. I mean, we I don't think we forget it in any way, but that means that it is dangerous for convoys to transit. And so we're looking at the rules that relate to specifying the routes and times, but also we're looking at the rules that protect um, humanitarian relief operations that are, you know, the staff are civilians, uh, the goods are civilian in nature, so they need to be respected and protected at all times by all the sides fighting. You know, what I, as you say, often we're making uncomfortable statements as lawyers, but it's a, a statement that we need to constantly say is there are two sides fighting in Gaza. So there is fighting going on and both sides have this obligation to allow and facilitate and to respect and protect at all times. Does it surprise me that humanitarian movements are limited? No, absolutely not. It's an area of active hostilities. I think an additional problem that was came out very tragically today is that there's no one there to manage the distributions. You can imagine that a WFP distribution in September was something that ran very, very smoothly with staff on the ground, with, with well-established arrangements for it. The situation today is, is dramatically different in terms of the limited capacity of WFP to be there. Um, the reality that there's no one actually um, responsible for public order and safety in, in Gaza today, um, and the number, the density of the people looking for the limited assistance that's coming in. So again, to me, I'd say, you know, it's not a question of the law not regu accurately regulating it. It is the very extreme situation within Gaza today that we're looking at. So we're in that allow and facilitate measures of control, breakdown of law and order. So it's, it's tragic, in terms of the amount of needs and the challenges of actually providing it in this situation of breakdown of law and order. Uh, thank you, Manu. I think there was um, there are three more questions um, which are related actually to responsibility, I would say. Um, yes. So uh, I think Jude refers to a particular example uh, in, uh, in for Gaza and then Anna uh, when they of not facilitating uh, these two questions, I would say they're uh, related. And then David has raised another question, which is more about the legal thinking, the legal rationale uh, on the. Position. Okay, let me just try and deal perhaps with. Um, I don't know whether it's Walid. You do you, Walid? Sorry. <laughs> um, it's Jude. Yeah. So, it's Jude. Okay, thank you. I I would say that. I mean. Deliberate attempts to stop aid from getting in, I, as I said, from what my understanding of the situation at the moment, although obviously that is extremely, the attempt is extremely problematic and it's something that must be taken care of, I actually don't think it is having a particular effect in terms of assets going in. The problem today is not the searches, the problem is once within Gaza, moving the goods and managing to distribute them in a manner that's safe. The next question is a proceedings against the parties responsible. And thank you so much. So how do we deal with violations of these rules? And I think it's important for us to look at it in terms of accountability and then in terms of, fine, consent has been withheld arbitrarily. Can I go in anyway? 
which is how it arose in relation to, to Syria. And in a way, the, as always, the, the legal side is actually easier on here. What are the consequences? Well, as always, I start with, let's not only focus on international criminal law. There are obligations on parties, state and non-state. Have there been proceedings? No, we don't actually see very much of this at all. I'm not aware of any legal proceedings, for example, in, in ICJ, or I don't think this issue has been addressed by any other compensation commissions like Ethiopia Eritrea. So not yet. What we have seen, though, is the imposition of sanctions. So sanctions have been imposed on particular groups and individuals for having um, impeded access or I'm paraphrasing now the different terminology has been adopted. So we have seen a number of instances where impeding access has been a basis for the imposition of sanctions. So in a way that's it's not accountability, it's a way of trying to promote compliance, but that's where we have seen it. Um, the other dimension of this is, of course, um, individual criminal responsibility. And um, the statute of the ICC, as originally adopted, only included a relevant war crime for international armed conflict. And it was formulated as intentionally using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival, including willfully impeding relief supplies as provided for under the Geneva Conventions. So we could have a whole conversation about this because it's actually linked to starvation of the civilian population, the threshold, the challenges of determining as a matter of fact and law when we have willfully impeded relief supplies, and also why refer to the Geneva Conventions when it's the additional protocol factors. Anyway, but that's what the crime said, only in relation to international armed conflict. Um, in 2019, the statute was amended, and we now have a similar war crime for non-international armed conflict, framed slightly different, but again, it's inter internationally using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival, including willfully impeding relief supplies. So we've now got these to war crimes. It's a difficult war crime just because it's linked to starvation. And we haven't discussed the prohibition of starvation today, but that's a really complicated provision. It's, it's really a mess. So if you were to ask me, do I think that these crimes, it's important that they're there as a matter of policy. Do I think they're ever going to be the basis for prosecutions? Probably not, because the violations that we're looking at would probably and far more easily be prosecuted as other crimes. But that's what we have. So in a way, that's the accountability framework. Another question was, OK, fine, forget that. But let's say I have a situation where a state has arbitrarily withheld consent. Does that mean I can go in without its consent? Again, a very live question in relation to Syria and predictably a question in relation to which there are divergences of view. Um, it's something that's addressed in the Oxford guidance um, and we need to look at other areas of public international law. And the answer will depend um, according to who would be conducting these unauthorized relief operations. Why? If it is a state that's conducting them, and it's rarely a state, or an intergovernmental organization, such as the, as the UN, UN agencies, funds and programs, these bodies, states, and the UN must comply with public international law directly. And entering into the territory of a state without its consent, as I said, violates territorial sovereignty, uh, integri territorial integrity and sovereignty. So even though Syria has violated international law, that does not entitle you as a state, as an international organization to go in without its consent. You would be violating this, um, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Arguably, there's some who argue, okay, it would be a violation, but it might fall within the heading of um, countermeasures, permissible countermeasures. So, uh, grounds justifying um, unlawful um, acts. I'm forgetting the term right now. Anyway, grounds uh, justifying um, violations. It's it's 
it's tenuous, an argument that could be made. It, would it be a permissible countermeasure? It's permissible. It's questionable. I know that the UN did not like this approach at all. So this is why it's in fact called the Oxford Guidance and not the OCHA Guidance, because the Office of Legal Affairs said, no, you've included countermeasures. We completely disagree with that. That cannot be a UN document. The argument is different if we're talking about NGOs, because an NGO is a private actor. It's not directly bound by IHL. So an NGO doesn't violate a state's territorial teg integrity and sovereignty by entering. It's like I don't violate a state's territorial integrity by entering. I'm a private actor. However, I might be violating its criminal law. I might be committing a violation of domestic law. And again, this is what we saw in Syria. We saw that Syria criminalized um, entry without a visa. And therefore, the staff of NGOs who came in without a visa, without its consent, were um, prosecuted. And it's problematic because NGOs do not have um, privileges and immunities. So we saw a number of the staff of NGOs, MSF, before the domestic courts. So. I think you kind of touched upon uh, on the final question. Oh, there you go. I, yeah, but maybe you would like to, to elaborate. No, and uh, David, I think this is in a way what we were looking at when you said self-help. I think this is the, the question that you were asking. Circumstances precluding wrongfulness. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Uh, is there any other final comment question? Uh, we we exceeded a little bit our time because it, uh, it was so rich, so uh, full, so thought provoking. While you were talking, man, I was thinking about Yarmouk uh, in Syria, the the Palestinian refugee uh, camp, and this emblematic picture where people showed up. Uh, uh, when humanitarian assistance was was given to them. Yes. Um, also, I thought other things like last year's earthquake in Turkey and northern Syria, and the question where it was required an additional Security Council resolution for humanitarian uh, relief to enter northern uh, Syria. Uh, there are so Don't many. Don't get me started, Maria. We could stay here all day. <laughs> yes, yes, there there are so many things. Gaza, as it unfolds today, uh, the last month, uh, but also as it unfolds uh, today. Um, uh, very, very interesting. Also, I want to wrap up here to tell us about the limits of law. You know, at the end of the day that, yes, uh, we have law, but knowing the law, I wrote down what you say is not enough. And this is also something that I'm trying to communicate to students. You know, that we are talking about a different reality. Thank you very much. Thank you really very much. That was a wonderful webinar. Uh, so uh, uh, full, I insist on, the, on saying that. Thank you for clarifying all these issues related to the role of uh, regulating humanitarian relief operations, of introducing us to this great picture, a nuanced picture that not, it's, it's, as you say, I really understand that the second state are low and facilitate is the key states uh, where most of the problems um, have um, rose. And on that note, I would like to thank you very much. And I hope we will host you in London in person uh, soon uh, to continue the discussion on other issues related to civilian protection. This is very important. Thank you very much. It was a great thank pleasure. You. To have. Uh, thank, thank you for your kind words and thank you all. It was a great session. I like lots of questions. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you very much, Liz, our PhD researcher who once more facilitated this wonderful webinar. Until next time, have a nice afternoon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.